peace be yours from our crucified and risen Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Today we continue our sermon series on the Easter Gospels. For those who take the Bible seriously, but not necessarily literally. Today we add a little twist. Not only do we consider an Easter text, but we do so in the context of World Malaria Day, for the ELCA. So what does the healing that Jesus performs in a pool by the Sheep Gate, called Bethsaida, uh, have to do with Easter? Or, for that matter, what does it have to do with us for today? I think that the only logical linkage is that the Gospel text is about healing. And the emphasis for us today is on the healing of malaria. But what would we have done with this Easter text without that connection? Just why is this healing story from the Gospel of John included as one of the assigned Easter season texts during this year? And I would suggest to you that the answer is not immediately obvious for the casual reader. And that a person may be tempted to simply settle on the miraculous nature of the cure of the man that had been ill for 30 years. But I would like to suggest to you that the metaphorical language of this text goes much deeper than that. The first clue lies in the description of the building. If you look at your Gospel lesson, you will see that it tells you that there was a pool there which had five porticos. Why mention that it had five porticos? What does that have to do, if anything, with the story of the healing? There's a second clue in the description of the people in the text. If you continue to read, you will discover that in these porticos lay many invalids, the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed, including a man who had been there for 38 years. Again, I ask, what does a large temple-like structure built around a pool with five porticos full of sick people and diseased people, what does that possibly have to do with Easter? Why is this text chosen as one of the texts for our Easter season? There's one final clue that is available to us for interpreting the meaning of this story. If you were reading this text in a modern translation and paying close attention to the verse numbering, you will see that it goes from verses 1, 2, 3, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. There is no verse 4. Now if you had an annotated Bible, there would have been a footnote at the end of verse 3, and turning to the footnotes, you would have discovered this or something similar. Other ancient authorities insert wholly or in part at the end of verse 3, waiting for the moving of the water. <coughs> and then verse 4. For an angel of the Lord went down at certain seasons into the pool and troubled the water, and whoever stepped in first after the troubling of the water was healed of whatever disease he had. Now, if you were a student of ancient cultures and ancient religions, 
you would begin to have a feeling that there is something going on here and you would be entirely and to totally right. What you are dealing with is a description of an Escalapian cult center or temple. Escalapius is the ancient god of healing, first known to the Greeks and then to the Romans. His symbol was that of a staff with a serpent wrapped around it. And from that we get our modern symbol for medicine, the rod of Escalapius, a snake entwined staff remains the symbol of medicine today, called a caduceus. In that ancient religion, or that cult of Escalapius, it was believed that the spirit of Escalapius, now dead, would return to his different temple sites once a year, and when he would return, he would enter into the water, and the water would be disturbed, and the first person into the water would be cured of whatever disease or illness they had. And so in cities around the world, there would be Escalapian temples built around pools which were inhabited by the sick and the lame and the diseased, each one in those temples hoping that they would be the first to enter into the water when it was disturbed. Hence, you can begin to understand the reading in the Gospel today when Jesus encounters this man who has been there for 38 years and he asks him, would you like to be healed? Now, I think his answer is rather polite considering that he's been there that long. I would have said something like, duh, why do you think I'm here? <laughs> but instead, he's rather polite, and says, yes, but there's no one here to put me into the water when it's disturbed, and someone else gets there first, and they're cured, and here I am. And Jesus says, take up your bed, and walk. And he does. And then we're told that it happens to be the Sabbath. Now there's a whole lot more going on in this chapter, but that's a whole class on the Gospel of John. We're just going to stop with this. But do you get the picture? Jesus is in an Escalabian cult temple. Next to the temple, in Jerusalem. And he chooses to enter that temple on a Sabbath day and to cure a man who had been lying there for 38 years. Just what is this Jesus doing? I want to tell you that the early church was so embarrassed by this text that by the third century they had filled in the sheep pools and eventually built a temple over the site dedicated to Saint Anne, who was the mother of the Virgin Mary. So that when people would come to Jerusalem, they would not see an Escalapian cult center there. They would find the temple dedicated to St. Anne. In the mid-1900s, a German archaeologist, intrigued by the text of John's Gospel, who knew about Escalapius and the cult centers, had an inkling that there was something awry at this site, and so he excavates the site, and sure enough, under the foundations of the Temple to St. Anne, he finds the remains of the Escalapian cult center, 
along with an altar for libation altar, uh, offerings, a pouring of water, which was part of the, the cult, with the symbol of Escalapius on it. But the question remains, what was Jesus doing in an Escalapian temple? Now, one way of reading John's Gospel is that within it, Jesus replaces or is defined as being superior to every major Jewish person and every major Jewish holy day. So that in the course of John's Gospel, Jesus is conferred to be greater than Moses. You might recall the passage, I tell you it was not Moses that gave you the bread from heaven. I am the bread of heaven. And Jesus is greater than Jacob. You might recall the story of Jesus at the Samaritan well with the Samaritan woman whom he entices to give him a drink from the well. And in the conversation of that between Jesus and the woman, the question is asked of him, are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drank from it himself? To which Jesus responds, I tell you, everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give will never thirst. And in similar manners, Jesus is defined as being greater than Isaac and greater than even King David. And then he also begins to replace the Jewish holy days. He replaces the temple. Who can forget? Destroy this temple in three days and I will raise it up again. He replaces the Feast of Tabernacles, or the Feast of Booths. He replaces Passover. If you recall, in John's Gospel, as the Passover lambs are being prepared and slaughtered, Jesus is being slaughtered. It is a 100% corollary, a split screen. Passover on one side, Jesus the new Passover lamb on the other side. He replaces the Day of Atonement. Hence the language of the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, reflecting the scale.